I bid you a warm welcome to St. James King Street on this first Sunday in Lent. It is a great delight to have with us once again as our preacher today, the Bishop of the Riverina, Bishop Donald Kirk. Welcome, Bishop Donald. We offer our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled and wandered far off. Let us then ask for mercy, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you and our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, saving God, who led your people through the wilderness, 
and brought them to the promised land. So guide us that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world and be brought to the glory of the world which is to come. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. A reading from the book Deuteronomy. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand, and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. For the word of the Lord.
a reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For the word of the Lord.
reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. For the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I go on, I'd probably like to say thank you to Father Andrew for the invitation to come and preach. Uh, You may not know this, but uh, thanks to COVID, this is the third attempt. Um, We set three dates previous to this one, 
And on each occasion, um, New South Wales government restrictions meant that uh, those dates disappeared into the wind. But it is lovely to finally be here again and to share something of the scriptures with you as we worship together. And we begin Lent. And as we begin Lent, we have the familiar story that we always read on the first Sunday in Lent, the story of the temptation of Jesus. Being the third year in the cycle of readings, we read from Luke's Gospel. And it's important for us to see this in context, because Luke's Gospel is what we've been reading, really, as we go through the year. And unfortunately, because of the way the cycle works, uh, and the fact that Easter is a little bit later this year than in perhaps a couple of previous years, it means that we've read various sections of Luke's Gospel that are beyond this moment in the story. So let's just see for a moment how we get to this point in Luke's Gospel because what Luke is trying to do and goes to great lengths to do is to establish for his readers exactly who Jesus is. We begin with the uh, birth narrative, uh, and Luke's gospel is what we always read at Christmas time because of the lovely story about uh, uh, Jesus being born uh, with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds visiting and the delight that that brings. Then we move on to John the Baptist pointing to Jesus and identifying him as the Lamb of God, as the one who would redeem. Jesus is baptised by John, and in that moment, God's declaration comes. But in Luke's version of that, God doesn't speak to the crowd, he speaks directly to Jesus. You are my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. You are my beloved son. They are the words that we hear. And what immediately follows that is the genealogy of Jesus in Luke's account. Now, this is distinctly different from the genealogy that we hear and read from Matthew. Because in Matthew's Gospel, we begin with the genealogy and begin with Abraham and work our way through to who Jesus is. But in Luke's Gospel, we wait until this point, having had Jesus revealed as the Son of God by the voice of God at his baptism, we then read the genealogy, as it were, backwards through history, from Jesus all the way through. It doesn't stop at Abraham, it keeps going. All the way through to son of Adam, son of God, which in Luke's point is very significant because he's trying to reinforce even in human terms, what God's voice has just said. This is the backdrop to what we now hear in the temptation. This wilderness moment, which again reveals Jesus' identity. I have to say that the wilderness in Israel is a bit like parts of the Diocese of Riverina. In fact, large parts of the Diocese of Riverina. Very dry, dusty, barren, isolated. Although I have to confess right now you wouldn't believe so because it's amazing how green it is even out there. We can experience wilderness whether we're out in an isolated, lonely spot where it is dry or indeed even within our own homes Isolation and fear can cause a sense of wilderness and loneliness. If there's nothing else that we've learned over the last couple of years, that is certainly true. But when Jesus went into the wilderness, he did not experience loneliness. He was alone, but loneliness and aloneness are not the same thing. There was the presence of God with him. And it was that grappling with the identity of God and identity of his own mission 
that he was there. So it was a spiritual experience to go into the wilderness, this wild and waiting place, a place of preparation. In a sense, it also connects us to a very basic spirituality in humanity, and that is that sense of grappling with God. It is a place to learn dependence on nature and its provisions, a place of extremes and contrasts, of wild beasts and desert. It is, in that sense, a place that reflects the Lenten experience that we should have in that we seek to grapple with our identity and relationship with God as we make this journey towards the celebration of Easter. And the grappling comes in the narrative of the story of the conversation between the devil and Jesus. If you are the son of God, the opening gambit. Now, we already know the answer to that. We've just read it twice. You are my beloved son, son of Adam, son of God. If you are the son of God, there's an arrogance here which is extraordinary. But he goes on, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now that may well seem like a very small thing. And certainly later on, Jesus goes on to feed thousands of other people with bread. But this is different. This is about self-indulgence. It's about making something into what it was never intended to be. And that is a very strong human trait. We come across things and use them in a way that they were never intended to be used or make them into something they were never intended to be, which is usually very unhelpful and destructive. The devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Now, this is not the cosmos, this is not the universe, but simply the inhabited world seen in a moment in time. And dare I say it, you could say again that this is small thinking. This is about power and control. Short-term power at that. And again, it is a, that human trait that we have, seeking power over that which we do not control. I was really rather struck last night. I was walking around Circular Quay, and when you look at the Opera House at night at the moment, uh, there is a lovely shade of blue and shade of yellow being shone onto the sails of the, of the, of the Opera House. A very clear identification with the trauma that is going on in Ukraine. And the Russian president's desire for power and control, which I suspect is something that he should not have. But whatever we think about that, it is right for us to be deeply concerned about the trauma that's going on in that part of the world. It is exactly this desire. And it is also the desire that is in us. It's all very well to look at that and, and criticize it rightly, but when we look at ourselves, we have this same tendency, perhaps not on a national level or a global level, but at a much more local and personal level, human beings are very good at trying to seek power over things that we do not really control. If you are the son of God, again, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. The devil plays literalist games with scripture here. A quote that suits his purpose. A demand for proof. But we don't need proof. We've already had it. There's the voice of God, born from heaven, clearly identifying who Jesus is, 
There is John the Baptist pointing to him as the saviour. What more do we really need? But there's also something else here. God does not protect us from harm. After all, Jesus went to the cross and died. God was not protecting him from harm in that sense. And God does not protect us from harm. But what God God does do is travel with us in all the various experiences of life, the good and the bad. And when we struggle with things, God is there with us to help us through and to bring us life. Underlying the dialogue between the devil and Jesus are two competing storylines. The devil offers a storyline of self-indulgence, make yourself bread from stone, self-aggrandizement, all the nations of the world will belong to you if you worship me, and self-serving religious identity. If you are the son of God, cast yourself from the top of the temple. Meanwhile, Jesus responds with quotations drawn from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, that show awareness of the true source of life and identity. He knows that life is more than food. His reliance on God, the one worthy of true worship and service. And his understanding of God's character, not one to be tested. Jesus' responses are rooted in the clear understanding that he is dependent on God rather than on self for life, glory, and identity. One final subtlety that we miss in the English translation. Luke speaks of time on several occasions in this story, each one translating the word chronos, from which we get the idea of chronological time, linear time, you know, the children count the candles on the birthday cake. But in the last verse where Luke uses the word time, Luke tells us, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Here, the word is kairos, a different word entirely, which means a different sense of time. Best described as the great divine moment that transcends and encompasses our chronological life, all chronological life. And that great moment has already been alluded to. That is the cross and the resurrection. Jesus' death and resurrection is the great divine moment that transcends and encompasses our chronological life, offering salvation to all humanity. As we journey through Lent, may we follow the example of Jesus when tested, being aware of the true source of life and identity, placing our reliance on God and recognising God's true character which is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. May we look forward to the great divine moment that is the cross, that is salvation encompassing us in God's love and forgiveness and life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him are all things made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge our baptism for forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church. Merciful God, in your love, you have taught us to overcome our sins with prayer, fasting, and generosity. Accept our Lenten disciplines, and when we fall by our weakness, raise us up through your unfailing goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, as we marvel in the wonder of your creation, we praise you for the beauty and bounty of this earth. Give us wisdom and the will to be careful stewards of your creation. We pray for all who are affected by natural disasters, those who mourn the loss of loved ones, those who are injured, and those who have lost their homes. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, we acknowledge with shame all the sin, hatred, and injustice that have led to inequality, violence, and war. We pray for all who suffer oppression for those whose communities are shattered, those who have lost their homelands, and those for whom human rights seem but a dream. As we pray for world leaders and for our own leaders, we also pray for ourselves, that we may be instruments of your love and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, as we pray for your worldwide church, we remember today the Anglican Church of Korea. And in this country, the Four Rivers Diocese of the Riverina, Bishop Donald, his clergy and people. We pray for our bishops, Kanishka and Michael. In this place, uphold our priests, Andrew and John, our church wardens, and our parish council. As we pray for ourselves during this period of Lent, give us an awareness of your unique sacrifice on our behalf and teach us to be humble 
in acknowledging that all our gifts come from you for the service of people and the spread of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, we pray with thanksgiving for our neighbours, our friends, and for the people all around us with whom we work and share our daily lives. We thank you for all the joys and blessings of family life. Forgive us when we quarrel and make us ready to forgive one another. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, we pray for all in special need, for the homeless, those who are isolated, those living in their own wilderness. We remember those who are ill, including Alan Gordon, Joan Elliston, Joyce Smith, Kath Marriott, Johan Nell, Campbell Wharton, Richard Aldersey, Robin Hobbs, Ruth Jones, Anne Ryan, Elliot, John Gillam, Amy Horsburgh, Francis Rolfe, Graham Cooksley, Lance Johnson, Jeanette Fox, David Cheatham, Badley Anita, Peter Rennick, Olivia Peck, Barbara Rothery, David. We pray that all may find encouragement and peace, that their sorrows and concerns be transformed into comfort and their loneliness into fellowship with you. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, we ask you to be with all who are grieving today over the loss of a loved one. May their sorrow be lit with the brightness of the resurrection. We remember the recently departed, Roy Radford, Nicola Tully, Jim Tully, Nigel Butterley, Margaret Dalton, and those whose anniversaries we keep at this time. Help us to know that you turn our darkness into light and that in your light shall we see light. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant Grant that that what we have have asked in faith we we may may by your grace receive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. And through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All glory and honor be yours, always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever-living God, we give you thanks and praise. For your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet he did not sin. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. By his grace we are able to triumph over every evil, and to walk in the way of his love. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. <laughs> Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, 
This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks. He gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. With whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As this broken bread was once many grains, which have been gathered together and made one bread, so may your church be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
God of mercy, may we who have shared in this holy meal know your forgiveness in our lives, bring your reconciliation to others, and be a sign of your wholeness in this broken world. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your spirit. Amen. You please be seated. Good morning and welcome to our worship today and greetings especially to those who have joined us for worship online. Once again, uh, a great joy to welcome uh, Bishop Donald Kirk. As he explained, we've had a number of attempts to have him preach here. The last time he did preach, he was the Dean of Grafton, so uh, it was a while ago. So uh, it's good to have him with us today. Please note, of course, Lent has begun and our Lent studies begin this week. Uh, and there are five groups meeting. Books are still available from the parish online shop or the parish office. You're welcome to join any of those groups. Today at four o'clock there will be a special service of thanksgiving for the life and ministry of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, this is being uh, conducted in conjunction with the New South Wales Ecumenical Council uh, and our guest of honour will be Her Excellency the Governor. Uh, next Saturday uh, the men's group will be meeting from 12 noon at the Cheatham's and the speaker is Dr Keith Carpenter. The annual general meeting of the parish will be held on Sunday the 20th of March from 12 noon here in the church. The meeting will include the receiving of accounts, the election of office bearers and any other business pertaining to the meeting. Uh, reports are now available uh, as you leave in the baptistry. Uh, there is a complexity of reports. Uh, there is firstly the general report of uh, the parish and inside that you will find the general financial report. And I think for most people that's as much as you need. However, there are also two other more detailed financial reports, one on the parish accounts and one on the St James Hall accounts. So they're available to, to you as you leave. Uh, if we run out, there's going to be more here next week available uh, then. Uh, you can also pick them up online and they're available uh, that way. Uh, please note coming up on the 27th of March is the next St James Institute seminar. Uh, it's a Sunday, it's at two o'clock. Uh, the speaker will be Professor Sathanathan Clark on the global diversity in the Anglican Communion. Uh, we sometimes forget that living in our little isolated part of the world that the Anglican Church is a much bigger and diverse organisation than, I might say, the Diocese of Sydney or even the Anglican Church of Australia. Uh, and this is an opportunity for us to hear uh, that great diversity that exists. Also, the Friends of Music Annual General Meeting is coming up on the 3rd of April. Finally, I encourage you to continue to pray for the people of Ukraine and for those affected by the floods in Queensland and New South Wales. Uh, ABM has opened up a special appeal uh, for those affected by the floods and uh, I did send a pastoral letter out last week and explains how you can give online uh, but over the next couple of weeks we will also receive retiring collections for that appeal. Would you please stand?
Christ our Saviour draw you to himself, that you may find in him crucified a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sin forgiven, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. <laughs>